worry about. No. Nope. <clears throat> so we just signaled. I'm not. I feel quite uh, quite relaxed about. Oh, things. good. Very good. But when I uh, when I start to read, I shan't be relaxed. I never you won't am. be relaxed. No. Uh, because I don't like relaxation. <laughs> relaxating. 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 That's very good. That's very good. <laughs> How, what else would you say if you wanted to say that? Well, relaxing sounds <laughs> funny. I mean, I mean, relaxing in terms of like deliberately relaxing. Relaxing, relaxing. Deliberate like relaxing. Well, I'm all right. <laughs> well, you get someone behind you. I'm just like, you know, that's it, right. <laughs> or like, you know, like uh, laid back. <laughs> Most people I know who are laid back have been laid out for some time. <laughs> <laughs> They're so bloody laid back they can't move. Yes, rigor mortal. That's right, yes. Rigor mortal. Right. How there, is must, my... there must be a Latin for laid back. What's the Latin for laid back? <laughs> Don't ask me anything requiring thought. Oh, he's done in. He's in the story. My goodness. Have I'm a drink. Fred, I kept him up vodka. much too late last okay, night. Okay, go ahead. Are we ready Shall to we go? Shall we go ahead? You're all right? We are rolling. We are rolling, as they say. We are rolling. Oh, Jesus. Which we... trade? <laughs> <laughs> he's mocking his trade. Yeah, right, <laughs> we are here, go on, as then. you can jolly well know, in London, in the studio of John Whiting, which is a name which in our station should resound a familiar bell. Is that the right way of putting those three words together? John was <laughs> a uh, figure in our station of great uh, um, uh, importance to me, to many, many people. He um, uh, was director of production many, many years ago, and he produced most of the radio drama on the station all those years, including James Armstrong's marvelous series, uh, the uh, cliché compendium productions, all my programs, and all practically everybody else's. But John is now out in the control room, so we do not hear his voice. That doesn't necessarily follow. <laughs> there. So all of our listeners should recognize John Whiting here in London. And with us in the studio is Elsa and I Thompson, as often said, is a marvelous person, a very distinguished man who is known internationally as a poet and a man of letters. If you don't mind that word, man of letters, I say it because I... <laughs> Do you? It puts years on you, actually. <laughs> Eric Mottram. Well, actually, I use the word because of an association with you. Uh, I remember Eric uh, uh, Kenneth Rexroth uh, once told me that he was content with being regarded as a man of letters. Oh, well, in that context, yes, I'd be proud. And uh, Eric Mottram was among his many books. Uh, Rick's uh, was someone I respected very much. And you edited a large edition of his work. Yes, that was a, a selection of his stuff that came out over here. It was called a Rex Roth, uh, Kenneth Rexroth Reader. Yes. And it was a thick book of, uh, of substantial parts of his work. Because he, written, he wrote an awful lot. And the idea was to introduce it to uh, British readers. Yes. Not by some Skinner's anthology, but by a really whacking great amount. And in those days, the uh, autobiography wasn't published in this country. In fact, it was out of print in the States, I think. So I got that uh, chunk of that printed. So it was a nice book. And he ah. liked it. He was very, he, he, he was tickled to death. You talked with him about it? Uh, he wrote to me about it, mm. but I didn't get the States, no. Uh, but I knew he liked it because he, um, he told me, and other people told me. So. How was he received here? In it was very well received, the book. And uh, it's not been reprinted, but that's, that's neither here nor there. So much isn't. But um, I think people needed it because, for the reasons I wanted to do it. That is, that he had written an awful lot. And so much of it was out of print. Yes. That and I, it, it included the essays, a lot of essays, from places like uh, magazines and things that, yes. uh, from which he'd not reprinted. So it was a good job. Yes. Well, aside from many books of your own poetry and essays, a book on William Burroughs, the algebra of need, uh, you, I guess, co-edited. Would you say co-edited the Penguin Companion to Literature in yeah. Latin America and America? Uh, however, um, many of your, at least the conversations with you, uh, emphasize Bay Area writers. Is there a, some particular thing about the writers in the Bay Area, like Ferlinghetti and McClure? And, uh, well, and I, and I, I belong to a generation of, of, of Englishmen, uh, a generation and a half, I think, because it, it, it's, it's, it's basically people, I'm thinking of writers and poets, between the ages of, say, uh, 28 and... And 57, 56, something like that. And it sounds like a long area. Yeah. But what happened was that, that after the war, uh, a quite a number of writers got really fed up with what was going on in, in poetry in this country mm -hmm. um, through a group called The Movement, which made itself an establishment. Area. Really, to us, very boring, unimaginative people, not really interested in inventive form. And uh, it was a revelation to us when we started to have imported over here the Ferlinghetti series, you know, the little square book, uh, those uh, yes, City Lights City Lights, Lights Publication. That's right. 
and which was, was suddenly on sale in London at, uh, at a marvellous bookshop called Better Books, and uh, and the Evergreen Review, yes, with the San Francisco issue, that famous thing. It, it all sounds like history, but to this generation and the one just behind it, this was where we learned that poetry could do something else. That is, that there were a variety of forms, there was a variety of techniques, that there was a whole range of poetry in some kind of English, if not straight English, which was something we never dreamt of, that we, that we, that we had no idea could be done, that we were in a kind of straitjacket. Now, this was a bombshell. What happened was that we had to think about that. Ginsburg, uh, Kerouac, Berlinghetti, Corso, Olson, Zukovsky, they were older poets, but they were new to us. Yes. And all that stuff, in a word, that was in Donald Allen's anthology. I bought uh, Donald Allen's uh, New American Poetry in Ferlinghetti's bookshop in San Francisco in 1960, just as it was published. I just happened to be there and took the book back home. And was I still got it. It's battered and it's sewn <laughs> together and it's, it's been glued up and it's a treasured item because that was the book that p put together instances of what could be done. It wasn't that we copied the stuff. Well, first of all, it's very difficult to shake ourselves out of, you know how it is, you come across something, and the first thing you want to do is to see whether well, you can do it yourself, yes. and you know, write you so poets, imitate it, and then drop it. But the effect on us of, of the range in that book, the range of possibilities, really jerks us out of our room. Did uh, it have an effect Decency. upon writers here? Well, <clears throat> it, had a, it had an effect on a number of writers, and there were meetings and poetry readings and so on. Yes. And for a time, there was a group of people who were affected, who, who ran the Poetry Society, that's the National Poetry Centre. And yes, it did. I was talking to a young poet, brilliant young poet, who was recently in San Francisco, working with Barrett Watton and, um, and Ron Silliman and those people, uh, and, uh, and uh, Bob Perelman. And uh, he was saying to me the other day that he still remembers He's what, I don't know, early 30s now. And he still remembers vividly the impact that the Olsen, Charles Olsen, made on him yes. when he was like uh, 23. And Jack Spicer. Yes. But Jack Spicer um, was so important to Alan Fisher, this poet, that in fact he brought out a pirated edition of one of uh, Spicer's work, After Lorca. And that's how we met, actually, because he phoned me and he said, I hear you've got copies of Spicer's books. And uh, my copy of Spicer has some poems missing. He picked up second hand those missing things. And that's how we met, through Jack Spicer, who was uh, two poets who are now very close friends, through this Bay Area man. That's what it's about. Why do you suppose there's this strange affinity between the West Coast of the United States and, and uh, London? I don't know. It, it, you know. All sorts of mystical things come to mind to do with the fact that it's one of the few bearable places in the United States, <laughs> as far as temperature is <laughs> concerned. <laughs> and, uh, and that. But... Um, since then, let's say that uh, when, uh, let's not say West Coast for a minute. Let's just say you know uh, to do with poets who are in that bag. When people like Jerome Rothenberg, who now is at yes. at San Diego, and um, and uh, uh, Treely, Ginsburg, Ed Dorn, these people come to England. There's a certain group of people, poets and, and readers, who want to hear these people. I think it's to do with the recognition of their. Of, of what we so much want, that is enterprise, inventiveness, imagination. And that is that is a technical draw to us, that it's very difficult to separate it out. Because when I go to San Francisco, or when Alan went recently, and other people go, uh, we've got addresses, and people we want to meet. So it's very difficult to separate out who we know. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether you know a man called Adrian Wilson, Yes. a, a book uh, designer and lecturer yes. on, on book design. I've known him since I was there in the 1960s. And he, he he's like he and his wife are like San Francisco to me. They were involved in the in the in the in the theater there. She was an actress, his yes, wife, that's right. many years. And uh, they first introduced me around. They took me up to Yerba Buena, uh, where Adrian yeah. had designed the menu, <laughs> I may say. And uh, and uh, they were the first people to drive me over um, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and yes. took me around. They really looked after me. But through them, I got to know people very quickly. And and uh, and then later, because of my interest in Michael McClure, through him I got to know people. That's a question of like of building up friendships in a place. So I, I, it's very difficult for us to separate the people we know yes. from you've, the place. You've singled out Michael McClure, right? Think, why? Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I greatly appreciate him. It's right. not that it's a puzzlement. <laughs> I just want to hear what you're. I don't know. I, I, I was very drawn to him. In fact, I wrote the. Uh, 
uh, this, I thought this was going to sound like a bit like boasting, but I, I'm very happy to say it, but I don't want to boast. I wrote the first um, serious uh, review of his work in this country, and, I, and according to him, one of the very first serious uh, articles on his work anywhere, which came out in the old anonymous days of the Times of Supplement. And uh, he was very pleased. Someone, uh, Allen Ginsberg told him, he said he recognized the style. I have a pro style, but I don't think it's terribly good, actually, <laughs> but he's recognizable, at least. And uh, Aaron Ginsberg recognized and told Mathur, and we started corresponding then. I was terribly intrigued by some uh, use of, of language and the structuring of the poem on the yes, page, with this, like, the central axis, with the lines, uh, like, balanced on it, like a, as if it was a tree or a fountain or something like that, some organic thing, and the lines, and this tremendous organic power in this that uh, I'd never seen before. And then I read his essays, and I thought, my goodness, you know, this man is really, he, this isn't chance, this man has uh, an intellectual structure. And then I was invited, strangely enough, to read uh, um, uh, a, a text of poetry for someone who wanted to uh, be interested in this in this country. And I found reading it intriguing, you know, and that's how I do it. And uh, then I got an invitation to write an article in a, for an American magazine called Margins, uh, which enabled me to have a bit of space and really got down to it. In fact, as, as, as Mike well knows, I'm being a bit slow in bringing out a promised book on his work. Uh, I regret this. Uh, but you know, a lot of other calls on one's time, but I have masses of notes, and it's going to come out soon. Is it the innovativeness in the, in the way they write, or is it something that they have to <coughs> say, or some uh, you know how content? Poets, when they talk about other poets, tend to talk about yeah. how things done. It's like, it's that, how it is with musicians that's right, or painters. painters that, that's right. What we're concerned, yeah. I remember seeing R.B. Uh, Kitai, the great uh, painter, who I know fairly well, and uh, saw him in the Tate Gallery, and he had his nose right up against the canvas by Francis Bacon. <laughs> and I can't stand Bacon. I mean, you know, I just cannot. And uh, I said to him, like, uh, Ron, it isn't that good. And he, and he, and he, he really had his nose absolutely, you know, just a few inches from the... And he said, but look at the way the paint's full on, you see. <laughs> and it's that the, the one's concerned with. And I said, well, like, it is a rather disgusting male nude, isn't it, something? And he didn't take notice of that one at all. He wasn't, <laughs> wasn't involved. But you know, to answer your question, I think in McClure's case also that there is a very serious content here to do with um, getting, it's a very, to me, a very Blakean context. I mean by that, not simply flattering to Mike, but to, th th there is this urge to penetrate beneath the surface structures of habitual reason into the instinctual, into the areas that we share with, with uh, other kinds of life, to make a, a, a very strong proposition that in fact, that there is a, uh, as Kerry said, all one life. He's a, he's a very, very uh, uh, professional romantic in that sense, yes. and is also in 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 the in the, um, in, the uh, in his prose in that Wolf book, the uh, uh, has a profound understanding therefore of what ecology means, and he, uh, everywhere everywhere there's a sense that he. He's not just talking superficially about conservation or about opposition in nature or something, but he's in fact dramatizing that. And that, that the subject matter is profoundly exciting to me. Mm -hmm. He keeps breaking the patterns and the sets of habitual uh, rationality to get down to just what our lives are like, and then inventing forms for this. And that is a formidable achievement. Is he singular in this, <coughs> in this respect, or does he fit into a kind of a group? I mean, as, say, Monet would fit into mm. the Impressionists. Uh, I don't, I don't think, I think his, his techniques are his own. I think they're very inimitable indeed. I think, you know, he's like Bartok or Dylan Thomas. As soon as anybody imitates him, you can see it. So you don't touch that with McClure. But there is a sense that uh, he is part of uh, a group of poets, I guess, Gary Snyder's the obvious example, who are interested in ecological subjects to do with... Um, maybe that is, I think that is, initially at least, a West Coast action. Maybe it's the presence of, the, of those... Of the of the forests, and the um, the nearness of uh, areas that need to be preserved. Okay. Maybe it means maybe it made Bay Area poets, or, or Snyder comes from further north, or north or Oregon area, I guess, how, northwest. I think he's into that as well. How does that uh, <coughs> how does that ring a bell with people and poets in London? Very much so, because because in um, 
the uh, in in London very much we're concerned with at the moment with uh, the organisations that are here to do with uh, to do with ecology. I mean, it's a political issue finally. See, where I do have problems with some American folk. <laughs> that is, that the endless battle to convince uh, American intellectuals and poets that in uh, investigative journalism in poetry or like statements about ecology is all very well, but you've got big problems without this. You might be rather self-righteously onto a good thing. And to translate that marvelous awareness in Snyder and, and others, um, there's a political action needed. Yes, isn't it a global... And that's where the Sierra Club, I think, uh, might uh, be included a little. Precisely. In, in fact, it sounds much more worldwide than yeah. just West Coast. I mean, the whole yeah. world is now involved in the ecological problem. <laughs> the great, so the great man for this, I, think, I was talking to you about him the other day, and that is the man who now lives in Oakland, called uh, Richard Grossinger. Yes. Who strikes me as being one of them, uh, without exaggeration at all, believe me, one of the most important men in America, and I mean that quite straight. I mean that the t anthologies that he's called I.O. magazine over the years, and his new book, which uh, Sierra has brought out, called The Night Sky, is really what one means by ecology in a big sense. That it, what he's been able to do is to, to, to include in these books poems, prose passages, citations from all kinds of books, building up the nature of, can we call it, the morphology of our lives, that is, the various ways in which people have written about the various aspects of nature and human nature. Marvellous books. Year after year, this, this marvellous resolution to bring out these collections of materials, that's what they are. Yes. What was happening in poetry before this began to take effect here? That was, that was sort of <coughs> dying out and that wasn't... Well, it's, what it's kind of poetry are you referring to? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is, I'm going to name names of this. It is, it is the poetry of a thing called the movement, which was basically a, an organisation of extreme conservatism. It was a reaction against Donald Thomas. Mm -hmm. A reaction against the elaborate imagery patterns. Uh, uh, a, a reaction to any poetry that wasn't immediately clear in its meaning. Which cuts out you know, Shakespeare, I guess, <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, Blake, yes. and a great deal. And uh, certainly all that, um, all that poetry like uh, Rambo and, uh, and others, which they would dub extravagant or excessive, do you see? It was a kind of timid classicism. Not which suggested that you, uh, you, fat, you, fat, uh, you, you tuck yourself down in the meaningful. It's part of a critical movement. Mm. That is that if each word in the line of the poem isn't analyzable, the poem is bad. You know? That idea of a, of, a, of a risky structure in which the structure of language might radiate out into ways that you don't know about. It's a very arrogant poetry and a very arrogant criticism implying that uh, unless these techniques can be used and implied, it just isn't poetry. What poets do you have in mind? People like what? Stephen Spender, possibly? No, I think he's a previous generation. He's of the Oxford generation in the 1930s. I think people like uh, Robert Conquest, Kingsley Amos, Philip Larkin, mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Sweet, Ted Hughes, to a certain extent. And uh, um, regrettably, someone who is on the West Coast, and I'm not going to be loved for this one, is, is Ted Hughes, is, is, is Tom Gunn. Oh, yes, Tom Gunn. Well, he's a British import, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> I, I knew him at Cambridge. Uh, oh, yes? Years and years ago, very slightly, because he was in, uh, I mean, and Ted Hughes was there, too. I think I, I was the first reviewer of his first book, I think, in, Ca in a Cambridge newspaper. But the, um, well, he's the, I, mean, I must say, though, to be honest, I think he's developed away from this quite a bit. But there's still a certain, it's, it's basically to do with the fact they will not risk um, inventing meters, inventing forms, inventing structures. Because their materials say to them that you mustn't risk that. They've got to be tidied away, they've got to be accurate, they've got to be meaningful. They come across a poem by Rambo or a poem by McClure or a poem by Charles Olson, and they say, well, what does it mean? And they mean by that each space and comma must have a clear meaning, yeah. paraphrasable structure. Now, some of us have moved away from that. We're not concerned with doing what prose can do better, you know, that kind of uh, simplistic actuary, uh, uh, actuality. And they dislike this intensely, and uh, we've lost the battle, actually. <laughs> 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 they are in power. Yes. Um, but uh, I'm bringing out this anthology with um, Carol Terrell, the, the Pai Duma, uh, editor, and man who runs the American Poetry Foundation from Ara, from the University of Maine in Orono. Uh, a big collection, which I hope to be a sort of Donald Allen of the new British poetry. 
It's getting a bit late now. We just started about 1960. <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of Americans don't realize that, that we have a very vi viable proposition here, which, 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 which could meet that anthology. Do you think just the, the books themselves and, uh, well, the words and the publications yeah. are enough? Uh, so many things happen in San Francisco or uh, in other great movements when the people themselves met, <coughs> like the Impressionists. Yeah. It was a matter of intercommunication. It wasn't just yeah. that they happened to see each other's paintings. Yes, and on the West Coast, the development of the beat uh, poets yeah. were as a result of those people actually being there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it doesn't mean that you always have to just be there. After mm -hmm. all, the French discovered Poe, but they never met him. I mm -hmm. don't think, did they? <laughs> they renamed him Poe. <laughs> <laughs> Poe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, is there any effort uh, or attempt to try to bring some of your people to California or the California poets here? And no. if they are there, do they? Oh, you not has to happen. Absolutely. What happened was, I mean, I've been there, I mean, not long ago to, to read a bit. And, uh, and and talk to some friends there. And Alan Fisher, this uh, young uh, poet who uh, I admire very much, a friend of mine, he was invited to by a group of uh, poets associated with language magazine mm -hmm. to uh, do some seminars in, yes. in, in the Bay Area, I think, uh, in Oakland, I think. And uh, th uh, as far as I can make out, they're very successful. And astonishingly, the first uh, s small, though it is, the first uh, British poetry uh, festival was held in New York mm -hmm. this last May. It was, a, I guess, a mini festival, but there were at least six British poets. Um, the, the money was found from some foundations, including Guinness, I guess, is the foundation. And uh, they supplied some, uh, some money. Yeah. They supplied some beer, too. And uh, six poets were there, Tom Pickard, Tom Rayworth, who was quite well known in the States, mm -hmm. Anna Fisher, myself, Denise Riley, and Wendy Mulford, two of our best uh, female poets, uh, um, Doug Oliver, and so forth. And they were all introduced, each one, very well, by an American poet mm -hmm. who backed the thing in New York. Yes. And the American poets gave a reading in support of it and so on. So we felt very pleased about this. At least this was the first British poetry festival, I think, in, 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 in America, as far as I know. It's interesting you're, pre uh, you're emphasizing the importance of finding new structures and mm. new technical uh, it's very similar in the development of modern art, certainly yes, the yes. visual arts. Uh, in the States, we hear a great deal about the importance of the subject matter. For instance, yeah. there's a feminist movement, there's a yeah. gay movement, there's a third world movement, mm -hmm. and so we have the gay writers and the yeah. feminist writers. And the. Uh, do you think that these people in their work are, um, are being true to art or, or yeah. being true to their movement? <coughs> it's funny, you know, I've just, I, this afternoon, uh, a student of mine was, um, came to ask me some questions about, that she'd been looking at Virginia Woolf, at the place where Virginia Woolf said that, that the, she was, was talking about one particular feminist writer, and uh, she was saying that the trouble with this woman is, that when she's writing about a feminist issue, is that she's forgotten what Keats called negative capability. And that is the idea of not, I guess, summarizing the idea of not writing propaganda, <laughs> by which I mean not <laughs> writing an, an exclusive action, but an inclusive one. Yeah. So that apparently Virginia Woolf understood this, this business, that you might, in fact, not write a work of art, but write a propaganda sheet for a, a singular cause. Yes. I think that issue is still very strong right now. I mean, the reason why I said that uh, Denise Riley and Wendy Mulford, uh, some of our distinguished lady poets, was quite simply they happen to be female, but they and they write from a, from what is recognizably in, in many of their poems a feminist point of view, but they are excellent poets. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no condescension to a simplistic propagandistic utterance there. They're really writing poems, writing works of art, which yes. is which is very difficult to do. But it's it's no more difficult than if you're um, an ideal ideologue of of any kind. I guess if you're if you're trying to write Christian hymns. And you're trying to make them into poetry rather than sort of Isaac Watts. It <laughs> seems that most of, the great, <laughs> most of the great artists have always done that. I mean, they've always combined their artistry yeah. with some yeah. kind of concern about life. Yes, yes. And uh, that's where the magic really is. But the happens. singularity is the problem, isn't it? That, 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 that if you're so con I just like that poem of Yeats's, you know, the Easter 1916, where uh, he's saying that the main problem was they, they sacrificed themselves to the cause. Yes. And if you're an artist and you sacrifice yourself to a cause, the trouble is you probably won't be an artist. You become a martyr who writes propaganda. And that's something else that I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> the cause may benefit, but then it may not at all. And I've seen the right. that happen. It's, it's, yeah. uh, I think it, there are cases like Mayakovsky, I guess, and, and one or two French 
I mean, my great hero is, is a French poet, not an American one, I'm sorry to say. That is René Char. That's someone who was a Mackey leader, you know, and a leader of the resistance, and someone who managed at the same time to be a magnificent poet. And that sense that in his poetry you feel that the, what is meant by resistance, by, by resistance, is, is a radiating term, not a, not a constricting term. But he really is a, a man of negative capability in that sense of tremendous range. But somehow he never gives up the resistance idea there to some fascist authority. I respect that an awful lot, I must say. It's an ideal for me to be able to do that. Eric Mottram, thanks so much for talking uh, with us. Uh, there's much more to be said on this subject, no doubt. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to have to leave, and uh, John Whiting is going to take over, and we're going to spend the rest of the program with the reading of uh, recent work of your own. Is that true? Fine. Thanks very much. It's been a nice toy yeah. meeting you for the first time, Eric. <laughs> well, it's and I appreciate it. Let's hope we meet again, and uh, for a bit more length of time, I guess, is the best thing to say. But yes. We will. We will. I'm planning it already. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> you miss your theater. Thanks very much. The bottoms Thank of you. my shoes are clean from walking in the rain. I can't stand my own mind. America, when will we end the human war? I did not know how to write a poem when I felt I wanted to be a poet. I was 13 years old and I was alone. No mother and my father was at home. I was in the streets. And no school did I attend. To exist, I stole minor things. And to sleep, I slept on rooftops. Subways, the city. Big wild city of New York.